I say anything? <laughs> My family was living in Los Angeles in the early 90s when the phone rang in the middle of the night. My parents were calling from their home in Ohio, but it was my mother's voice that announced, he's dead. Not even a hello. God damn it, Albert is dead. Albert was my uncle, my father's older brother, who at the age of 58 went to bed in his Atlanta, Georgia home and never woke up. My grandfather and three of his brothers also died at the age of 58, so growing up, death had always been a dark cloud of expectation of an early grave in my family. Though not practicing, barely knowing the rules, but loving the food, my father's side of the family is Jewish. And the one rule that we all seem to be aware of is the, the tradition of burying the dead within 24 hours. And that night, I was on the phone booking a flight to Atlanta. As the sun came up and the birds decided that it was light enough to sing, my six-year-old son Justin and I boarded a flight to Atlanta to meet my parents. I saw the funeral as an opportunity for Justin to meet my father's side of the family, a, a chance to meet people who up until that point had only been a series of names and stories. I woke Justin up after the phone call and I tried to explain to him that what was about to happen. I even made a list of people he was going to see with corresponding photographs. I have no idea what he was thinking. He was quiet. He rubbed the sleep out of his eyes and he nodded that he understood. But how can a six-year-old understand that he was about to board a plane to Atlanta to see people he didn't know to honor a man he never met? That's what I was thinking when we were on the plane. Justin was sleeping on my lap, but then it suddenly taunted on me. I didn't pack Justin anything that could pass as presentable to be worn at a funeral. As soon as we landed, we quickly popped into an airport clothing store and I bought Justin a white shirt that was too big and a clip-on tie that was too small. I was in a hurry and I picked anything that looked like it might fit. There wasn't any time to fix my mistake. My parents' plane landed, and after a quick reunion with hugs and kisses, we rushed to pick up our rental car, which turned out to be a red eight-cylinder Lincoln Continental with a hood that stuck out like a battering ram. It was after all the 90s. My father, a college professor, loved to pretend that he was rich by renting obscenely big, expensive cars. We gathered in the ostentatiously huge Lincoln Continental and drove directly to the cemetery. We were, of course, late. In fact, the service had already started. Glenda, my uncle's widow, was reading from the Torah, and we tried to join the small clump of relatives we barely knew. We stood next to the mound of dirt piled beside my uncle's dark brown mahogany casket amidst an ocean of gravestones a fragmented family next to neat rows of the dead. Justin kept pulling in a shirt tail that awkwardly spilled out of his pants, trying hard to look presentable with the ill-fitting costume that I made him wear. When Glinda finished reading from the Torah, I decided to pull Justin aside, and we went behind a large gravestone just out of the family sight line so that I could help him maneuver his shirt into something more comfortable. As I was unbuckling Justin's pants and stuffing his shirt into his waistband, I saw Glinda march up to Albert's oldest daughter and emphatically point to Justin. <laughs> and it suddenly dawned on me that Glinda thought that Justin was peeing on the gravestone. <laughs> I quickly buckled Justin's pants and we scurried back as Albert was lowered into his grave and we each, including my six-year-old son, grabbed a clump of dirt and pensively toss it onto Albert's coffin. I looked over at my father, who was standing at the edge of Albert's grave, staring down at his brother's eternal resting place. And the silence seemed so loud, and the tension so real that all I wanted to do was to eat a salty, warm handful of McDonald's french fries. I, I know, I know, don't judge. We all have our ways of coping. I, I'm sure you can tell that I tend to eat the supersized version when I'm stressed. I don't laugh. I have always I gotta stay on script. I have always had a Jones for McDonald's French fries as a relief from conflict. It's my drug. Healthier than heroin, not as effective as weed, but certainly more practical than drinking and driving. 
That's the problem with planning a cross-country trip in just 24 hours. You're not prepared for the stress of family. But the golden arches were nowhere around, and I had to focus. The french fries would have to wait. After the funeral, my immediate gaggle of family headed to the obnoxiously huge Lincoln Continental. When Glenda took my mother by the arm and a heated, whispered discussion soon brewed into an audible fight. Without turning around, I distinctly heard the word urinate, and I knew exactly what it was about. <laughs> my mother is a lioness when it comes to her young, especially her grand young, and she quickly countered with a, go fuck yourself. <laughs> which was right on point for my mother. Like Sir Lancelot, who suddenly woke up from a peaceful sleep, my father pulled my mother away from Glinda, and we quickly piled into the Lincoln Continental, unsettled but unscathed. We drove out of the cemetery to Glinda's house to sit Shiva, but the junkyard dogfight that started at the cemetery continued at the house. Back and forth, little quips quickly turned into all-out assaults between my mother and Glenda. Your grandson put his feet on the sofa. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> I can't believe how ill-behaved your grandson is. And my mother's response? Fuck off. <laughs> the night eventually came to an end, and we left the battlefield and piled into our rented eight-cylinder red Lincoln Continental. I was driving. Justin sat next to me. My parents rode like royalty in the back seat to our hotel in downtown Atlanta. My mother continued to bitch, whine, and complain about Glenda's attitude. And my father was quietly looking out the window, oblivious through decades of practice of my mother's rants. As we were driving towards the blinking buildings of downtown Atlanta, I thought to myself, you know what? It's 11 o'clock at night. What I need are McDonald's french fries. <laughs> that I've been jonesing for all day. And wouldn't you know it, at that exact moment of need, a shimmering golden arch appeared like a thunderbolt <laughs> flashing across the sky in front of me. And I immediately turned the Lincoln Continental into McDonald's drive through And I stopped at the menu filled with delectable pictures of processed food. And I ordered my stress-relieving supersized fries. Justin took advantage of the situation and asked for a happy meal, but he just wanted a toy. No hamburger or french fries. I just want the toy car, Justin said, pointing at a picture on the menu of a red Hot Wheels race car. I have to admit, the red car looked pretty cool, a symbolic representation of her own Lincoln rental car. Can you get a happy meal without the meal? It turns out the answer is yes. I ordered the toy along with a side of my supersized fries as my mother continued to bitch and moan about Glinda from the back seat. And I noticed that there was a white car that had been idling in front of us. Uh, there was no one in front of the white car, but I didn't pay any more attention to it because my mother called Glinda that bitch. And I turned around and told her to stop talking like that in front of Justin, which made her angrier. And then the white car suddenly pulled off to the side of us. Again, I didn't think too much about it because I was edging closer to those delectable fries. <laughs> With the white car no longer in front of us, I pulled up to the drive through window. My mother said something unique along the lines of uh, that fucking bitch. And I turned to her and I said, will you stop? I cannot take it anymore. Then Justin repeated one more time, can I get my toy? And I said, I'll get you your Happy Meal toy. Then I turned to the window, the drive through window, and I found myself face to face with a barrel of a gun. I, I assume the gun was loaded. A rather fluffy man whose face was covered by a red bandana was reaching out through the drive through window, his long arm extending all the way into the car with the barrel of his pistol pressed precariously against my forehead. Execution style. He held the gun on its side, and I remember thinking that for once, TV shows were right in their depiction of a robbery. <laughs> I didn't know it at the time, but when Justin saw the gun, he immediately unsnapped his seatbelt and crawled underneath the dashboard. I had the following choices available to me. Don't move and hope beyond hope that this man whose face was behind a red bandana does not shoot me and my family. Choice number two, wrestle the gun out of the man's hand. Or choice number three, slam my right foot through the gas pedal, surging gasoline into all eight cylinders of our Lincoln Continental. That, of course, is what I did. 
I slammed on the gas. The rear tires screeched like a scene from rubble without a cause. And my usually quiet father screamed, what's happening? I shouted back, gun, gun, he's got a gun. As we sped out of the McDonald's drive through the white car that had pulled over to the side of the restaurant raced to block the exit of the driveway. Now, I had another set of choices. I could either smash right through that white card with my red Lincoln battering ram. And for a, sl a split second, that was exactly what I was going to do. But remember, my son had curled up under the dashboard. And he certainly would have been killed if I went ahead with my first choice. Something told me to go for choice number two which was to swerve around the white getaway car onto the embankment and sidewalk and then slip over to the road and then zoom down at full speed away from the McDonald's and the white car and the man and the red bandana and the gun. Once we were far, far away from the Golden Arch dystopia, my father said, we have to stop. They're murdering people there. I guess he had a point. <laughs> I stopped at a payphone and called the police. I dialed 911 and I said, I'd like to report a robbery at McDonald's in Buckhead. And the person on the other end said, we've already had that incident reported and we have a description of the getaway, getaway car. You guessed it. <laughs> the victims of the robbery described the getaway car as a red Lincoln Continental. <laughs> There was another McDonald's robbery later that evening. The police cornered the McDonald's robbers in a white car. There was a shootout between the robbers and the police that resulted in the death of a few of the perpetrators. Clearly, the red bandana man was more than capable of using a gun. Their arrest, however, did mean that we are off the hook and the police were no longer looking for a red Lincoln Continental. It was past one in the morning when we finally made it to our hotel. I could not bend my right knee. The muscles were still in panic mode. And my brain couldn't find a way to tell my muscles that, that there was no longer any danger. As soon as we walked into our hotel room, Justin turned on the TV and sat on the edge of the bed and silently stared at the epi an episode of Sesame Street. As Ernie played with a rubber ducky, I asked him how he was doing, but he simply shrugged his shoulders without taking his eyes off of the TV. Justin is now 36 years old, and he has two daughters. And every now and then I ask him if he remembers anything from that night when he and I flew to Atlanta for my uncle's funeral. Oh, yes, he says in a tone in which his voice flutters with recognition. But then he never says anything more than that. In fact, he usually changes the subject. I know that my choice is... I know that the choices I made that night were a perfect storm of luck. It was lucky that the man in the red bandana was too startled to shoot me. It was lucky that I went around the white car instead of crashing through it with my son hiding under the dashboard. When we got back to Atlanta, the first thing I did was to buy Justin a McDonald's Happy Meal with a Hot Wheels car without the burger, fries, or drink, of course. I have not looked at McDonald's fries the same way, which is probably a good thing but I will need to find another vice for stress relief.